well, first of all, it is really an honor to have been um, chosen to be a panelist for the first ever Mass Cultural Council Institute. This is an amazing day. I can't think of a better way to start a weekend than spending time with artists and people who are in our cultural organizations. So I'm from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which is out in the Berkshires. And um, I want to give a little bit of background about our city, um, a little bit of its history, where we are today, and where we hope to go as it relates to art and culture, and sort of the role that government has, that local government, that the city of Pittsfield has had in nurturing the art and culture community in our city. So uh, Pittsfield is one of those cities that Anita referenced in her opening remarks, a one-town city. It was a general electric city. We, um, at one point, had almost 60,000 residents. General Electric had an enormous footprint right in the heart of our city. They employed at upwards of 10 to 12,000 people at a time. They were a major, major part of Pittsfield's history, culture, economy. The people that worked there lived in our neighborhoods. Their kids went to our schools. They participated in politics. They had uh, powerful union groups. They were really an entrenched and important part of Pittsfield's history for probably 40 years. So we have generations of Pittsfielders who still today remember the legacy of General Electric. Well, over time in the late 70s and early 80s, they began to shut down certain parts of their facility. And eventually, the last guy there turned off the lights and GE was gone. Completely. Completely gone. They left behind contaminated land, vacant buildings, and a lot of community heartache. People lost their jobs. It was devastating. It was epic devastation to our city back in the late 70s and early 80s. And we are still struggling to recover from that post-industrial decline. So we went from 60,000 residents to 45,000, just under 45. So what, that, what does that mean to a community? Vacant houses, vacant land, um, low value in our community, low value property. Um, and a, a psychology that I describe as group depression. Right? A lot of anger, a lot of group depression, a lot of just for 20 years we have suffered from what was devastating to the community both from a psychological standpoint and economic standpoint. Um, I, our identity was completely tied up with General Electric. Now when I talk about this story and I talk about how important it is to honor and remember that past, it's also important to understand that we are now designing our future, right? And millennials will say to me when I, when I say, tell this story, they'll say, will you please stop talking about GE? I don't understand it. I don't relate to it. I wasn't here then. Can we move on, right? So that's an important message that I hear. At the same time, I think we can't appreciate how far we've come as a city and how far we still have to go if we haven't thought about what that meant to, to Pittsfield. So um, along comes the year 2003 and there is a huge political movement in the city of Pittsfield. And it's driven by um, a candidate who was running for mayor and some candidates who were running for city council. And I was one of the candidates running for city council at the time. And there was a political action committee that came together to support candidates who were running for office, who uh, particularly women and minorities, but people who had progressive ideas. We, it, it was an amazing, an amazing alignment of thinking, philosophy, courage about we are going to take our city past, uh, beyond our past, honor it, and we're going to pivot and move away from it. Now, we had some things going for us, this group of political activists who wanted to start taking over some leadership responsibility for our city. So 
and I'll tell you about that in a second. So a new mayor was elected, a new city council was elected, and this group of 12, one mayor and 11 members of the city council, and a group of professionals in, in our city government had an alignment of belief about what are we gonna do next for Pittsfield? How do we redefine ourselves, right? So we take office, and we begin immediately thinking about art and culture and how to connect our city to the rest of our county. How many of you have been to the Berkshires or are familiar with Berkshire County? Right, thank you, that's a lot of people. I'm so glad you spent time there. From North County, which would be Williamstown, where Williams College is, all the way to South County, Sheffield, Great Barrington, that part of the part of our county. There are incredible art and culture institutions, theater, galleries, museums, amazing dance uh, um, at Jacob's Pillow. We have Tanglewood. So our county is rich with art and culture, internationally renowned. You know who wasn't part of it? The biggest city in the county. We had no value up until about the year 2003 for art and culture. We had a Berk, we had a little museum there, and we had some theaters that were vacant and run down and uncared for. And it was clear to me and others who began um, serving in political leadership at the time that we were missing out on a very important economy and a very important way to move our city past our group depression by celebrating art and culture. The very first thing, the very first hard vote I ever took as a member of the city council was to appropriate one million dollars. Right now, remember, Pittsfield is in decline. We had been given um, a fund of money from GE as their parting gift. We've contaminated your land, but here's some money. Um, and we took. The, it was a ten million dollar fund. We took a million dollars of that fund to restore the Colonial Theater. I don't know if you're familiar with the Colonial Theater, but it's been described by James Taylor, who performed a PBS special in that theater after it was restored as a jewelry box. When, you, when I walk into it now, I am still in awe of how beautiful this theater is. And I'm gonna tell you something that was a hard vote to take because many people in Pittsfield did not get it oh, this is for a different group, this is for the elite, this is the wine and cheese crowd, we don't need theater, we need industry. Well, I happen to think you can do both things at the same time. And if you are working on creating a place where people want to live, comes along opportunities for economic growth and supporting business and jobs. And art and culture is a key piece, in my mind, of creating a place where people want to live. So that began our long journey um, where we, um, we, we supported the Colonial Theater in its restoration. And then Barrington Stage came. And we had storefront artists who took occupied vacant storefronts on our downtown and um, made art in full view of the public. And people could walk into the studio space and experience and interact with the artists. Now, the next thing that we did, and um, what I think is very important message that I hope I can leave with you today, at the same time that we were investing in the Colonial Theater and Hancock Shaker Village and Barrington Stage with money, we also created the Office of Cultural Development, which is a department inside city government. So that, that, that was another one of my proud votes. Yes, we as a city government, are going to make a very specific and intentional uh, department whose role it is, is to advance art and culture and be a network between our artists, our cultural institutions, and the city of Pittsfield. So that department exists today. And for small money, $120,000 is our annual municipal budget for the Office of Cultural Development. We are able to leverage that network of um, planning, funding, grants, 
and it really put a stake in the ground that Pittsfield is serious about their art and culture community. We support our artists. We believe that they enrich our lives, that they can help us grow our economy. Yes, we need small and mid-sized advanced manufacturers. We're not going to make the same mistake we made when we put all of our hopes and dreams in one company. We're not doing that again. We're going to support a diverse economy, and that includes the art and culture economy. I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to the conversation as, it, as, as we carry on for this morning. Thank, thank you so much, Mayor Tyre. Um, Pittsfield really is uh, a model that we look to um, for our cultural development and, um, and collaborative spirit, and your leadership has really been central to that, and we appreciate it very much. Um, our next uh, panelist is Joe Curro from uh, the town of Arlington, um, which has really, really been doing some, um, some excellent work, most recently as a cultural district as well, uh, some terrific institutions, and um, is, is uh, advancing the work at a rapid pace. So Joe, uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you tell your story? Thank you very much. Come away from the speaker. Step away from the speaker. Okay. How do I do this to the rest of the right? So first of all, how many of you know who have been to Arlington? Oh, that's pretty good. How many of you know where Arlington is? So let me tell you something. Just first I want to tell you how I ended up on, on this panel in the first place. Where is the speaker? Okay. So it was Super Bowl Sunday. And if you're an elected official, especially on Super Bowl Sunday, the last place you want to be is in your local supermarket. I think the mayor can relate to this because you're never going to get out of there. You're going to run into people left and right and you're going to, you're going to spend an hour, hour and a half. So I went next door to Lexington and I'm tooling around getting my um, chicken wings. And who comes tooling around the corner but Mary Jenkins? She says, oh, Joe. She says, we've got this panel. You want to come out there? So I can't escape going to Lexington even. It's important for, to, to, to mention that, though, because Arlington actually rest, it lies right between Lexington on the one hand, which we feel has stolen all of the glory from us as far as the Revolutionary War history. We had the bloodiest battle the first day of the Re Revolution. And on the other end, we have uh, Cambridge and Somerville with their uh, emerging and very vibrant uh, cultural scene. So I've entitled this presentation, Investigating the Scene of the Crime, because this is breaking into City Hall. Um, yeah. And crime, by crime, I mean communication, regulation, in, invitation, motivation, and engagement. And I will tell you there are two crimes going on on this slide. One is the tortured acronym, very tortured, and the other is that picture there. And that is actually uh, yours truly. I was the um, Grand Marshal of the uh, Fox Parade, which is part of our, our uh, street festivals, leading a, a, a honk band. You know, if you know honk from Somerville, uh, for our, our little parade with giant puppets and stuff. My, my memoir is going to be uh, Grand Marshal of the Puppet Parade someday. But um, <clears throat> at any rate, you'll see a few caution pictures. There's, there's actually an old adage that I, the first rule of politics I was told is, never be photographed wearing a funny hat because we had one governor who was photographed wearing a clown nose that kind of brought him down to another governor who ran for president he was wearing a snoopy helmet running for president and that kind of brought him down but i just threw that rule out and you'll see a few costumes here along the way so communication i, I just throw out a few things that, 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 that just ideas i want to give you some ideas about ways to engage with your public officials especially your elected officials to try to kind of motivate us into a partnership oh shoot yeah. Okay. Uh, information booths. We have a town day. We have a number of street festivals. Our, our cultural organizations always make sure to have information booths, reports to governing bodies. If you're looking for a way, I, I love that question um, during the um, opening session. Do you know? Do, do you know the name of your town manager or mayor? Do they know your name? Well, one of the ways that I and my board, we are a five-member board, get to know is. Um, our cultural organization, and in the back there, Stephanie Marlin Curiel, who's the chair of our Commission on Arts and Culture, they come and they regularly report and they regularly present at board meetings, which are broadca broadcast on the local access cable. And that is a way not only to get the word out to the community, but to really engage the elected officials. We have a lot, a lot on our, our plates. Um, you know, op-eds and news coverage, news coverage. You see some, some coverage we got for our cultural district. That was awarded to us in August, and uh, there's one of our street festivals, the local access cable, you know, web, websites, proclamations, 
we're asked often to, uh, for special cultural events, we'll get requests for proclamations from, from the board, and at times we'll read those at the meetings. We'll, we'll, it's an invitation for board members to go out and actually uh, appear and take part. Well, boxes, cable, openings and ribbon cuttings. These are ways to try to entice some of your um, local officials who may not have this as their top priority to come out and engage. Regulation. I, I say regulation, and that's kind of writ, writ large. Um, we have a, a very successful light pole banner program. We, we put that in the form of a policy before the board to try to encourage that. You'll see on the right an initiative that we have with um, youth banners. Um, there was a grant that was given to us by the uh, parents of a late high school student. Every year we have art from the high school that is chosen. I, I have the privilege of being on the jury for that every year. And we, we hang them out in the spring. And you know spring is coming when the light pole banners go up. Um, governance structures. I point out, Stephanie, she's part of, we have a number of governance structures. We're getting into an alphabet soup in Arlington with the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture, the Arlington Cultural Council, Arlington Public Art. We have the Arlington Center for the Arts, and everybody's getting them mixed up. So there's an effort right now to, to really tighten that up. Vacant storefront incentives. We, we were suffering some vacant storefronts in the downtown. There is a registry fee for that, but we put in an incentive that you can be waived. You can have that registry fee waived if you put public art in your, uh, in your storefront. Special, special programs. Um, yeah, we can get it. When we get into the q and I can talk about, um, about that a bit. Um, performance and exhibit spaces. We've really, we've really um, pushed, pushed that. One thing that we pushed was, um, oh, one, one thing that we did was we passed a bylaw around street performance. And I'll, I'll say that it hasn't been accessed that much. I mean, you can get a permit for 12 bucks and we don't have uh, really designated spots. But what it did encourage was the conversation, the conversation on the floor of town meeting. It passed unanimously, and it, and it helped with some of the buzz as we were trying to get things going. Parking holidays for the festivals. Invitation. Well, here's another one of these costume shots. The, the 100th anniversary of the Regent Theater. I didn't get to drive that car, but we, they did ask us to uh, dress up in period clothing. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, invite your public officials. Invite them to events. Invite them to be on juries for, for, for uh, things. You see a painted bench down there? I, that's our cheerful way you sit. It's one of our fundraisers for our public art. And I've been invited several times to be on the juries for that. Working groups, we have a big cultural planning effort. Sponsorships, et cetera. I, I, I have very little time, so I'm going to roll through these. Motivation. Arts matter because they help me be fun, quirky, creative, awesome people. That was during one of the breakout sessions we had. We had a, um, you've got the Metropolitan Area Planning Council here. If any of you are in the MAPC area, definitely touch base with those folks. Arlington was the first community that worked with MAPC on an arts and culture planning process. They now have a formal practice at MAPC. They, 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 they launched, we were kind of the pilot, and now they have a formal practice that provide great assistance to our local communities. Cultural preservation, we passed the CPA a few years ago to try to help us with that. Economic development, tourism, new funding sources, community involvement. Oops. Well, I, put, I, I also I put up there, very important point, I put up artists, grazi artists. I think we all struggled with this also. Uh, when you're making the case to your local officials, you'll find some local officials who want the culture and arts, they want to promote it for art's sake and they're into that. But some local officials, you're going to have to make the economic development argument and the, and the creative, and I think we all know that. I think we've all experienced that. So I just throw that up there for, as food for thought. When you said we all struggled with that, I thought you were talking about laughing. <laughs> well, I struggled with that, too. <laughs> I, had to I had to Google that to make sure I had all of the, uh, the questions right. Um, and engagement. So, Definitely engage with your elected and, point, uh, and appointed officials, planning sessions, businesses, schools, libraries, parks. Uh, what you see pictured here are some of my favorite partnerships that we had. You see the gentleman who's standing there next to the big, the big mural. We did something called Arlington Stories out in East Arlington. And it's just like the mayor said, that you have this struggle sometimes when you're bringing the arts and cultural um, uh, efforts, and there's a sense that it's elitist, and it's for the new, um, what you say, the wine and cheese set. What we did with this project is we went out and we reached out to businesses that had been in the commercial district for decades. We said, we want to hear your story. And not only do we want to hear your story, but we want to put up 
picture of you or you and your family running your business with your story written out right next to it in a temporary you know installation with you know the wheat paste um, paint and, and stuff and the businesses loved it and it was, it was wonderful and it got people down into the commercial district just walking around to read these stories in all of the, the all of the walls in the commercial district that little robot on the top on the top it just looks like a little it looks like a robot but that's a huge partnership that we've had in our town that was a, a birdhouse project it was a contest that was put up to the public to design a birdhouse for a newly re redeveloped park the libraries got involved they hosted the um, the birdhouses to let people vote on the, on the contest the park and recreation department got involved to, to help us you know scope out this the space for this the girl scouts got involved in, in the installation of the birdhouses arlington public art was actually coordinating the whole thing this has been one of the beauties, I think, in Arlington, and part of our you know, secret sauce, especially with the cultural district and such, is when we wanted partners, we started out with really, it was the commission was driving the effort, but the three core managing partners of the district, we went to the Chamber of Commerce, we went to the Arlington Center for the Arts, which is our nonprofit arts center, and we went to the library. And the library is the local government entity that has actually started driving all of the cultural district activity Shortly after that, we hired a, a fantastic new planning director who I, I wish you could see her. She's speaking at the same time on another panel. She partnered with our library director. The planning and the libraries and the nonprofit sector and the business community partnering all together. And it is such a model of cooperation and it has brought in you know, sectors of, of our community that um, you might not otherwise think of. So think of what you've got. Think of what you've got. Think of what you've got in your school. You, you may not think you have a burgeoning cultural scene, but tap in a bit there um, is what my advice would be. And finally, I'll just leave you this, this one last party thought. Take the light out of crime. And that was year two of the Grand Marshal of the uh, Fox Parade. I don't know what's gonna happen this year, but uh, thank you very much. Okay. I'm in the town of Barnstable, um, and I'm gonna stand over on this side of the um, because I am usually behind a counter, and you're the I'm the face that you're going to see um, when you go break into City Hall. And I actually really don't like that term. I'm going to be really honest with you, um, because yes, artists are about breaking rules, but City Hall is not, <laughs> and um, you're going to get in big trouble if you break into it. So. I think the term that you really need to think about is collaborating with City Hall. Um, and it's proof right there that collaboration is really where it's at. Um, you have to work with town government and they have to be your friend and vice versa because that's how you're going to actually strengthen your community that you are there to enhance, that you want. That's the reason why you pick a particular community or a particular area is that it's about enhancing your special event or the program that you're offering that you want people to participate in or that you want people to understand what, what the history, what your legacy of the community is. And you have to work with the individuals that are tasked with helping you. So yes, it's a daunting task, however, um, to give you a little bit of a background on my history, um, and I don't know if you read any of our bios or anything, but um, yes, I've worked in municipal government on Cape Cod for the last 15 years. I worked in Provincetown for four. I worked with Wellfleet for three years. I worked in the town of Yarmouth for four, actually five, and now I'm on my fourth year in the town of Barnstable. So I'm literally going from the very tip of the Cape all the way down to the middle of the arm now. And, but previous life, I was a dancer. And I was not only just a dancer, I was a professional dancer. And I came from a family that was not dancers, but um, my brothers were. So I danced with American Ballet Theater and Joffrey Ballet Company. And I danced at the Kennedy Center and the Lincoln Center, and I danced all over the country. And I also got my bachelor's in fine arts from Southern Methodist University in dance performance. How the hell did I get into government? <laughs> okay, so, yeah. So I actually, I did not come from a family of artists, really. My brother, though, was a dancer for Paul Taylor Dance Company, and my brother, my younger brother danced with Pacific Northwest Ballet Company. So 
But my mom's side of the family was all in government. We lived in the Washington DC area and a lot of my uncles were in the National Park Service. And I got out of college and I was like, I don't know what the heck I'm gonna do. I really don't want to like, you know, arts, oh, oh, okay, maybe I'll be a teacher, but I don't really want to do that. And my uncle gave me the wonderful opportunity to say, sign up for the Park Service, you'll get to travel, because that's what I really love to do. And you'll get housing, you'll get to travel, you get to meet people, all sorts of stuff. So I got a job with Yosemite National Park for the first season as a fee collector and bear patrol in the valley. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's very strange, but it worked. And I started loving it. I started actually really diving into it. And that was a passion being a child growing up in Washington, D.C., um, where, you know, you teach in schools, power of the community and everything. So on Cape Cod, we learned about cranberry farmers. We learned about, um, you know, the, nat the um, environment and all sorts of stuff. Well, in Washington, D.C., we learned about government. And we went to the Smithsonian's. And we went to the Capitol for our field trips. So there was already a built-in passion for it for any of the students that live in that area. And I dove into that passion. And so fast forward, I get a job in Boston, the National Historic Park, actually as a dispatcher. And that's where I met my husband, and who is a National Park Service um, law enforcement. He's the deputy uh, chief for law enforcement for the National Seashore. And hence, I moved out to the Cape when we got married. And I got a job in Provincetown, working in the licensing department, being the director of it for the licensing. And that's where I started building the community aspect of my position. So I was tasked with helping artists, helping businesses get licensed. And what do they need to do to hold special events? And no better community than Provincetown to actually be my initial <laughs> town, where it's only a small community of 2,500, but it balloons up to 40,000 people during the summer. And then on 4th of July and during Carnival Parade, you have a whopping 200,000 people crowded in a three mile long, one mile wide community. Whoa. So, I have included, um, Greg, if you can actually pass these around. Okay, so I have actually, because I have experience, a wide variety of experience working in different communities, Wellfleet is a fishing village that balloons up to about 25,000 during the summer. Yarmouth is a 24,000 year-round community. Um, again, I've had exa um, experience working with town selectmen and town councilors, because Barnstable is a 45,000 population, but balloons up to 200,000 during the summer. That's not including special events. That's also not um, including people traveling to the islands because we are the transportation hub for the Cape. And because we have the airport, we, um, we have the, um, the ferries going over to the islands, and we have the trains coming in, and that's where I actually am really loving Barnstable. So with my expertise, I created a cheat sheet for everyone because I'm sure you guys are all into holding special events, you're not on our side of things. So how do you talk to somebody from the other side of the desk when you come to any type of regulatory office? And this is going to help you, okay? There are differences between private events and public events. And there's differences between public property and private property. And there's also the differences between one community and the partnering community, the next door community. So yes, it's a daunting task. However, it's not as actually daunting as you think. The way that I think about it, and I present it to people, especially artists and people who are, that's their job is to actually think outside of the box. So how do you think outside of the box when it comes to regulating and actually um, getting everything that you need for your special event. Okay, so I'm a dancer, and I was trained as a dancer. I was also trained on how to create choreography and a production that you could put on stage. And that's what special events you have to think about. You have a director, you have a producer, you have your orchestra, you have your conductor, you have all your musicians, you have your lighting directors and 
tech crew, you also have costumers, people that are actually working on the scene. Then you have your dancers or your actors or the people that are gonna be your performers. And you've gotta rehearse that. And you have a long time to come up with a planning. That's the same thing with special events and you do need to treat it that way. You can't just come to City Hall or Town Hall and say, I wanna throw a massive event big party or whatever I'm going to be celebrating, and I want to do it this weekend. <laughs> you will be surprised standing on this side of, of the desk and be like, oh my god, no, 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 So you're setting right up the failure for town officials who want to help you, but they can't because their hands are tied with certain types of rules and regulations that are out of our control. It's not only out of the, even out of the control of the lawmakers, the local law officials. It's actually even in the state level that some of these regulations are set that we can't even do anything about. So make sure you prepare. That's the big thing I have to just recommend to everyone is just make sure you come prepared. Give ample time. Give about like at least three plus months so you can go through all the permitting process that you need to do. So this is in generic, you know, the generic, just things to keep, like helpful hints just to keep reminders of, is that use of town property, those kind of things. Um, make sure that you think about security and medical when you have large numbers of people. Think about bathrooms, parking, where are they gonna park? So those are all the things that you will need to check on. And a lot of communities actually don't, don't have the luxury of having an arts and cultural um, department that actually that can help you walk through you through or even a special event permit coordinator or even a permit coordinator they don't have that so where do you start my suggestion town manager board of selectmen's office or the town mayor's office or city mayor's office start there their administrative assistants are the go-to people for they're the, really if you don't have an information desk at city hall or town hall they are the information desk. And I've worked in the town manager's office for eight years. I got enough phone calls that I became the information <laughs> desk. Um, so they know where to start at, okay? It's a, it's a given that any type of, especially if you have a special event at on town property or city property, they are the go-to. The mayor or the town manager is going to have to sign off on the use of town property. That's their charge. So start there. They will be able to guide you if they don't have, if the community that you want to hold a special event doesn't have a permit coordinator or somebody that can actually hand hold you, hold your hand and walk you through the process. Um, and so they'll take you to the, the building department for tents, and that's what we call in Barnstable enhancement permits. What do you enhance? What do you want to enhance your event? And um, so you have signs, you have electricity and entertainment, you have want to have alcohol or food. Those do all require separate permits. So just be aware of that and make sure that it's timed in there. Um, and then I did also put some extra little helpful hints on the back of it um, for you. A lot of communities nowadays, you have to keep in mind, if you have vendors, if you want to do like an arts and crafts festival or something, keep in mind that a lot of communities now are going into plastic ban bag bans. So be cognizant of that. Um, and also recycling, they might have recycling requirements. So just double check on those kinds of things. Those are really important that you want to be able to not forget, you want to think outside the box. Again, think outside the box and um, double check with your town officials on those requirements because that's the last thing that you want to do and add stress to you um, a week before your event. And they're like, oh yeah, by the way, and then you have to let all your vendors know no more plastic band bags in your, um, that you can bring. So, um, and talking to the community organizations, getting them involved, not just actually inviting them to the event, but before the event. Keep your events in line. My only real recommendation is keep your events lined with the mission statements and the strategic plans of the actual town, because that's where you're gonna get your support. Is, is that's how you're gonna be able to talk to your elected officials, is that when you do your research and you look at the community that really mends with your special event, you can actually take that and say, okay, this is economic development. This is 
about conservation or community type of things. And you can then go to your um, business organizations, your village associations, your elected officials, and then that's where they can help you through the process in the support and plugging you to the right people because it's not necessarily what you know, it's who you know in town government that's gonna be able to help you get your event out there and as productive as possible. So on that note, I hope I helped a little bit, but definitely um, my information is at Town of Barnstable, and I am definitely the type of person that if you want help, please reach out to me, and I am definitely, I can help you through the process, or at least guide you a little bit if it's a little daunting, so please find me on the Town of Barnstable's website, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, this is really excellent practical practical good information and this this is a terrific resource that I think we can share with a lot of our, our local cultural council partners and community partners and I imagine it isn't an accident that um, uh, your your experience as a dancer has made you uh, nimble uh, and uh, given you the capacity to work through many different kinds of problems um, and uh, it, was, it was a terrific presentation. I also want to make sure I welcome your family. It's, it's really nice to see them. Um, your mom is a special lady who's doing terrific work, so welcome. Um, all right, so I'm going to dispense with my questions because uh, you've answered a lot of them in um, your presentations and open it up now to the, uh, the audience and let's, let's get some Q&A going. Who wants to start? Right here, go ahead. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you all so much for your presentations. They're really helpful jumping off points. Um, my main question is whether you have any advice to give um, those of us who are sort of coming up in towns or coming up into cultural centers where there's a lot of ingrained habits and a lot of ingrained um, non-collaboration and ways to come in that doesn't feel threatening, that doesn't feel like, you know, we have new ideas and we're going to totally overthrow the way things have been done, but we have new ideas and we would like to work our way into the flow of what's happening. Are there ways that feel sort of less combative and a little less challenging that, that you've noticed or that you would suggest? Um, I, th I think that's a really great question. In, in, in Pittsfield in particular, that was one of our battles, was getting people who had been in our community for a long time, for generations, to understand the importance of art and culture in our community. And it's always about, and I, and I can tell you this as, as someone who was a member of the city council, who became city clerk, and, and now I'm a mayor. People need to understand how what you're proposing will help them with whatever they're doing. So for example, in the Storefront Artist Project that we launched in the very early stages of our evolution, it was about talking to the neighbors on either side of that vacant storefront to say, you know, if we can bring in um, an artist and they can exhibit their art in this window, that's gonna bring more people down to this block and it will benefit your restaurant. It will benefit your shoe store. It will help you um, have more foot traffic. So being able to articulate how your project or your art is a benefit to the people immediately impacted gives them a reason to support what you're doing. And you still might, you still might, especially people who are who have become somewhat cynical. They still might say, Yeah, I, go ahead. I think it's great, but good luck. Good luck. I've been here for 40 years and you know, so you you just have to push past that and move and just keep moving forward and eventually the attitude of of celebrating art and culture starts to get infectious. Don't get discouraged. Just go just take the next step to get your to get yourself um, in, ingrained into that culture that's really entrenched, but you're just trying to slowly lift everyone up out of it. So just stay with it. Um, and in Pittsfield, we it helped us that we had some very specific big public art events. We we had a Sheep Tacular, which was a huge, massive public art event. How we, can we forget Sheep Tacular? I know <laughs> the sheep are still like legendary. And um, we, we've had some smaller art, public art projects since then. 
And when the entrenched cynic sees how much it enhances community life and they see how much participation there is and there are people coming to their restaurants and their stores, that's when they get convinced. I hope that helps. Nice. Yes. Yeah, and oh. Ha. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, Joe, 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 jump in one, one more. Yeah. Uh, no, I think I, I gave one, one example of the Arlington Stories project, but we, we started really with baby steps and incremental. The first major public art project that our Arlington Public Art group did was a, a large uh, mural. Now, one of the oldest institutions in town is the Arlington Boys and Girls Club. Uh, it, it sits on um, Spy Pond, so it, it has a big, large facing, well, uh, facing Spy Pond. That is, that's an institution they're about to celebrate their 80th, 80th anniversary, and, and the governance there, it's, it's mostly it's families who've been in town for generations who have kept that, that place going. But they were approached by the public art folks saying, we would like to do this huge moral, uh, mural on, on the wall facing the pond, covering the wall with, with four panels which will be chosen from um, high schoolers' uh, work. So there was a partnership with the schools and there was a partnership with this, this institution that really was, represents, if you quote unquote, old Arlington, if you, if you, sometimes that's the vernacular, old Arlington, new Arlington. But um, it was just incremental from, from, from there. And I think once you get the buy-in and people really uh, enjoy it and see the value, I think you, you can move forward. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, if I could offer a suggestion, Brockton, only city in Plymouth County, elected official, one by one vote the first time, part of the, how would I say, up and coming, want to make some changes. Make the media work for you. I speak from total experience, hunt them down, <laughs> be in their face constantly. And you know what happens? The next thing you know, they're begging for stories from you. And I, sp and I mean that. The lo local paper, um, for us, it's the Enterprise, and they're, they're wonderful to me. Uh, local radio stations, we have phenomenal, phenomenal relationships with both of them. Make your community access work for you. Most of the time, they're, they're dying to. And also, don't hesitate for the larger audiences. You'd be surprised. Television cameras from the four majors come down. And also, the, um, that, what do I, uh, the Globe and other, other newspapers. Like I said, I speak from experience. We've been in Yankee Magazine. We've been, um, we're, you know, and of course the social media is all over the place, and one of our restaurants makes Yelp 100 two years in a row. So we know about the new culture, the old culture, and trying to revitalize, but I'm telling you right now, the media works for you. Yeah, that's, Thank that's you. great advice, and, and you know, as you, as you indicated, a lot of the local media, you know, have, um, have, have seen their staff shrink, and they're constantly in, in uh, search of good content, and if you give them good, credible content in a timely way, uh, they will run it, and uh, arts and culture are central to the vitality of a local newspaper, and so your, your interests certainly align, so, so good advice there. Can I ask a question to the, uh, you that just spoke about Brockton, so are you part of the Sorry. Cultural Council? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, a, I'm an elected official, so I can't be, but we vote to appoint them, and I'm sorry, I had, uh, 18 years of experience with cultural council, you know, begging for grants, <laughs> uh, for writing them and begging for them, and helping others do so, and teaching others to, to write them and themselves and, and get the opportunity. So when I became elected official, they already had an ally. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah, sure. um, hi. Uh, what would be your advice for um, artists who work in um, nonprofit organizations um, and kind of depend on the hierarchy to uh, get their ideas out to um, the city and can be somewhat uh, restrained a little bit um, to, as I said, get their ideas out? What would your advice be? Okay, um, how to get your ideas out. <laughs> um, my only suggestion would be actually 
Start with the art teachers in the schools. They're the ones that have actual more connections than anything. Um, at least that's my experience as not only just a resident on Cape Cod, but also a parent. Um, I'm floored by the resumes of art teachers in schools, at least where my kids go to. Um, they're very highly accomplished, distinguished, reputable, respected artists in your local community. And that's what they do for their day job. Um, that's where they get their health benefits, usually. So start with the school and um, and then find out where else they can actually, where you can branch out and get support. Um, Liz, where there's Liz, money. I was just going to say, you had actually a really good piece of advice earlier. It's similar to a piece of uh, advice I gave uh, to some communications students. Um, when you said that you should look at the town's, say, master plan, yeah. the town's strategic plan, the town's major goals, um, I think sometimes we um, forget that those are there and that, it, it, that it's easy for us if we take the time to see ourselves in those. Could that be another strategy for an artist? Absolutely, that's, yeah. a, that's a huge strategy. Um, so the other component of it is um, if you're in a town, you actually have a lot more voice than in a city because you are able to get a uh, the annual town meeting on the warrant you can petition for money so people forget that and when i really liked it when when everybody said do you know your town manager do you know your town government do you know you know i've worked in both types of settings a town council and board of selectmen and if you've got a petitioned article unfortunately i'm, I'm sorry but they have to accept it on the warrant and they have to vote on it, and they have to go through the whole procedure of reviewing it through their cultural council, and that's, that actually is a huge component that you, both of you um, women had actually asked about it, is how do you get actually more support, is showing how much community is dying for this, and that there's really a need, because then they're gonna tap into it, because then they're gonna be like, okay, there's a force that we didn't even recognize, and there's a way that we can ride on this and actually move our community upward and be noticed. And that's, I'm sorry, being speaking as an appointed official, that's huge for elected officials. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd echo a lot of that too, and I'd say just push. If you're trying to get your art out there, you can self-organize. I mean, I think if we've seen anything this week, we've seen that the kids have, have a real voice and, and, and empower students. Students do. I mean, I know a group of our students, um, I don't remember, they, were ra they wanted to raise money for a particular charitable event, and they contacted the town hall, and they went into the hearing room, and they set up actually a sale of their work. It was an exhibit, and it was a sale, and they invited the community in, and that was one way that they really got their, their, their ideas out. I think partnering with the, the art teachers, a lot of times you'll find that the art teachers are involved in the greater you know, arts, arts uh, movement within the town as well. That's certainly the case for our director of, uh, 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 of arts, and we've incorporated youth art in the banners, in the mural I mentioned, in our Transformer Box um, uh, pa painting, we, we, we made sure that a certain number of those was set aside for young artists. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Thank you. Mm. Uh, one, one or two more. Yes. Hi, Elisa Hupp. Um, I'm coming from a small town in the greater Boston area, and we the town's going through a lot of changes. Um, so when you talk about like community plans and town planning, a lot of that is in development um, and hasn't always historically been made available to the public. So um, we're struggling with you know townwide making sure that um, town council is more transparent. Um, we have a new, almost brand new town council. Um, a lot of smaller organizations are popping up. Um, there's a lot going on around us in neighboring cities. And what I'm wondering is if you have any recommendations for tapping into what's happening um, in the cities around you um, while still being able to um, kind of assure the town um, that you're not that we're not trying to be Arlington, we're not trying to be Boston, that we are, we have a, you know, we can still develop our own town identity and celebrate that while tapping into all of the amazing things that are happening around us and pulling some of that traffic our way. 
So I think, and, and I'm just going to tell the story again about Sheeptacular, and the reason why it was so successful is because it tapped into Pittsfield's history. So if you look at your small town and examine and explore its history, that gives you an opportunity to say, oh, so in Pittsfield, we hosted the very first ever agricultural fair. And one of the most important livestock at the fair was merino sheep. And that sort of, so there was a historical component to the Sheeptacular event, which was a huge public art event. So the idea was we had um, these sheep that were designed and then artists, a juried artist competition to paint the sheep that then went out into public locations and were sponsored by organizations. So it was a successful connection between our own identity as the city of Pittsville, we didn't try to do Jacob's Pillow, we didn't try to do Clark Art Institute. We took an aspect of our own history and created an art event that celebrated the history, but in a fun, creative way that people really, and then at the end, we auctioned the sheep and we had a fundraiser for our arts community. So, there's a, so, so looking at your community's history is rich with opportunity for, for creating public art events. Thank you, Mayor. I'm afraid we're out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, but, you know, our, our panelists, I, I hope, will be around. What a terrific panel. Thanks so much. For your